share love to one another. We have love for a spouse. We love for our children, but the love God has is, is something we can't put into words. That song comes to mind, you know, this whole thing about 
if every man on earth was a scribe, then you take every stock and you had to make a pen and all the sky was paper, you know, you still can't tell about that stuff. Pretty powerful. Let's start service the word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your love, for your incredible love to us that you've done so much. You sent your son, you, you provided us a home in heaven. Thank you. Help us to share that love with others. Bless us in our service this morning. We welcome you here. Help us to worship you in your name. Amen. Stand up with me if you're able. And Karen's going to leave the same. 621. Six hundred and twenty-one. Six hundred and twenty-one. All my life long I have been.
take up her offering. Stephen, you brought the offering, please, sir. Lord, we thank you again for your goodness to us for another opportunity to come to your house. We thank you also for this chance to give back a portion to you. We ask that you take it and just bless it and help it further your work here and around the world wherever it's used. We just want to thank you for all you've done in the United States. It's good to be back here in his house. It's good to be back with all you dear people. And we just can't praise the Lord enough. I am feeling stronger and praise God for that. I am um, now clear that I can drive. I've only drove downtown two short stops. But, and so I still have my good chauffeur. So praise the Lord. I just... Can't, we just can't thank the Lord enough for his goodness to us and for healing. I know how it ways to go, but I'm back and I'm on the path to that. And thank all you people. I praise you. Praise God for all of your well wishes and <coughs> all your love. Also, I'd like to um, request ongoing prayer for Keegan. She has been able to attend school at most of the days this um, this starting the school year and she goes out to Shalom um, but she still is under Hershey's care weekly for testing and um, medications as needed. Also I'd um, like to request prayer for Ruth Musser. She still has ongoing issues with her low blood count and has um, needs blood transfusion. <coughs> she does have some Test scheduled coming up here, several tests to to determine what is causing that and um, treatments needed for that. Well, let's keep Ruth in our prayers, and we're so good to see Ruth here. Monica, I just want to praise the Lord that uh, He spared Camp Freedom once again. Uh, they had some damage to their property, but nothing came through. They didn't lose any buildings. <clears throat> Just a few trees down, some other damage, but they're still there. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to ask for uh, prayer again for Eric Metz, uh, or Murph, whatever, Eric. And uh, he's hopefully they're going to be doing surgery for him at the beginning of the week. He had had colon cancer a couple years ago and had his complete colon removed and now they found another tumor that is pressing on his kidney and his intestines and he's in a lot of pain and they have two small children. I just want to praise the Lord for the good safety of travel we had. Uh, a lot of miles on and uh, we didn't have too many problems. Uh, I do want to thank the Lord that I got CR and that was a special Yep. Um, I'd like to ask for prayers for um, my best friend's um, daughter. She lost her husband last Sunday. He's only 36 years old, and she has his three 
sons um, that she'll be raising, and they definitely need our prayers. That's that's tragic. Pray for this family. Next word, praise or prayer request, that one. I have to praise the Lord for his protection and his goodness. Yesterday we went down to Hagerstown to watch my cousin Gabby's swim meet. I praise God for that fun family time and the, the just the being together to celebrate, you know, watch Abby, Gabby do her swimming. So when it was all done, we went shopping a little bit and then we stopped at Arby's for lunch. And while we were there, Wendy's got robbed, which was right across, like literally right beside where we were at. So I feel bad for the people that were at Wendy's, but I have to praise God that he didn't choose Arby's, that he protected us and God kept us safe. <coughs> So I just have to praise God because he gave us a great day of family time and his protection was very strong yesterday. I just praise God. Scary, scary to watch. One of my friends from a number of years ago used to manage a Wendy's in California. And uh, because of the, this is in LA, because of their crime rate and everything, they were very sneaky about how they handled the night deposits. And so when it came time to take the night deposit to the bank, the manager would leave a little bit early. Um, and this wasn't him, but somebody else, I believe. Um, and leave the store, leave the restaurant, and then circle back around and come back in like they were getting ready to order something through the drive through and then give them the night deposit through in a and he won me back like he was getting food. Well, the manager that was doing this was in line and the person in front of them, their order ended up being the night deposit. <laughs> <laughs> and the manager got food. <laughs> and he said, surprisingly enough, that person was actually honest enough they brought it back. <laughs> So, just an option out there. If you go into Wendy's late at night, you might get lucky. <laughs> Somebody else, word of praise or prayer request? Stephen, go ahead. I, I need to praise the Lord for his protection in this week. I had an incident that could have ended up in bed much worse than what it was. Um, so, I just want to thank you for that. Angels on duty. Diane? Thanks for praying for Claire. I mean, he's cancer-free, but he's not completely the whole way because he still has stitches in him and stuff like that, and he has to heal inside. And we have to wait for a while, so he has to go back for several more treatments to find out to make sure. And he says go from the MRI and a CAT scan to find out if anything else is wrong with inside. But at least he's, we're hoping completely everything, but they said he couldn't believe how far the cancer was inside, but it's up to his colon. Mm -hmm. And they had to come out of that house. So he's clear now. He's okay. And he's able to go back to work. The doctor said he can get back and do some work. Yeah, good. Because he was tired of seeing me lifting all the heavy stuff. Let's keep clearing our prayers. Anybody else? All right. Well, would you join me then? And we will. Bow for prayer. Father, we praise you for who you are, what you do for us, and as we said earlier, your love. Thank you for your protection that we've heard today, various stories of um, keeping one safe and just recognizing that you care for us. And we praise you for that. We thank you for our church. We thank you for our family here. Would you give each person a special, renewed determination to give all they have to you and make you their number one priority. And Lord, would you help us to stay close to you as we're going to talk later. Thank you, Lord, that Ruby's back with us and we praise you for her, her healing. Continue to help her as she mends and has therapy. Just renew her strength. 
Continue to pray for Mary Jane and her challenges and those helping her. Be with Tim and Glenda. Continue to strengthen Jack. Think of Keegan and her family. Lord, just, just continue to help them. Continue to be with Peggy as she's facing challenges and health issues and pray you'll be with her. Continue to strengthen and heal Claire. We thank you for how things have gone for him and pray we continue to strengthen him. Be with Ruth as she's struggling physically and we praise you for her life and her testimony. Be with this friend's uh, family of, of Monica's that lost their loved one, which is tragic, and I pray you help this young mother be with her in a special way. And also, um, um, I'm sorry, Deb's, Deb's family, a friend that lost a loved one, and pray for this friend of Monica's that's dealing with cancer. I pray you give him, him a special touch and give the doctor's wisdom. I pray you'll strengthen this family in a special way. Lord, once again, would you help us to focus on you today, help us to hear from you, help us to open our hearts to listen to your voice in your name. Amen. So remember tonight, Jesse Rivers will be here. For those of you that do not know him, he is ministering. His, ministry, his mission is children, and he's working with Spanish children. He's working on establishing a mission in Mexico now. They were in Guatemala, but because of unrest, they had to leave that country, and they're now working to establish a mission in Mexico. <clears throat> he's going to be here tonight, and I encourage you to come hear him. If for nothing else, he's a very encouraging person to hear speak and um, a good friend of mine. Revival starts October 27th and runs through the 31st. I uh, encourage you to come out and support that. Uh, Dwayne Quesenberry will be here. Um, I've heard him speak at our previous church. A, he's a really good speaker, and I'm sure you'll appreciate him. Trustee meeting Tuesday night at 6.30. Remember, we have spaghetti meal flyers in the back. You can hand them out. We're looking to, to do this for volunteer um, thing for our community, and we need all hands on deck from the church, and just encourage each one of you, if you can make it, just come out and the goal is to try to, to build relationships in our community. And I encourage you to come out and support that November 8th. Remember, it is in the bulletin, but just draw your attention to it. Our Sunday night services for November are 1st and 3rd. And just make sure you check that out. And also, uh, we will have this in the bulletin. If it's not today, I actually didn't look too closely. Um, I think actually it is. Uh, we are taking up an offering for hurricane relief over the next two Sundays. Not today, but the next two Sundays we'll have a plate in the back. And what we're going to do again is if you feel the need to give to that, whatever you give, the church board will match out of the treasury and we'll see how much we can donate and this will go to Samaritan's Purse. They do a fantastic job of relief and hurricane or just disaster areas. And you help down there. Any announcements I'm missing? All right. Karen's going to lead us another song, and I'll share the message with you. 593. 593. I think we have actually never sung this, but you'll recognize the tune. And I think the words are pretty. I think you'll like them. Oh.
It actually goes well with my message this morning. If you turn your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 33. I won't ask some ask you how long it's been for some of you how long it's been since you've done this, but I would be surprised if someone here has not played hide and seek as a child. How how many of you have not played hide and seek ever? You see, that's kind of what I thought. Some of you here still play it. Some of you have learned have yet to learn the great art of good hide and seek. If you, some of you younger ones need to know, I can teach you some good tricks. <laughs> um, I'm sure maybe even some of you play with your grandchildren. I remember when I was young playing games of hide and seek with my friends and my cousins especially. And we would decide that 50 was an ample time to count and ample time to get them to their hiding places. Um, but if you know anything about hide and seek, the faster you count, the less time they have to find a hiding spot. So you just run off to hide for the fifty. Here I come, right or not? You know you can get to fifty pretty fast if you missed like thirty numbers, right? There is something uncertain about that, a little bit risky because you want to go get a good space, but you don't know how fast they're going to count. And the advantage is if you get a younger younger kid, they count slower, so then you can find a better place. But even if you weren't hidden, that seeker was coming. Ready or not, here he comes, was what he yelled, right? I want to read our text this morning. Ezekiel 33, verse 1. I want to read down to verse 7. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory, make him their watchman. When he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet but did not take warning, his blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet and the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes away any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require of the watchman's head, watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. God has placed different people <clears throat> And in strategic places as watchmen for him, he's placed parents to be watchmen over their children. Placed missionaries to be watchmen over the place the Lord has called them to serve. Maybe Sunday school teachers. You have a church has have placed a very solemn responsibility in me to be the watchman for you as a congregation. And I'll tell you very straight, there are times when it's very intimidating and scary. It's hard to believe 10 years have passed since I first came here. Um, and the other Sunday, and I forgot to say it when I got up to speak, but as I was getting the live stream ready, the memory popped up of Bishop Rob and the, and the board members praying over me and my wife. And that was 10 years ago that Sunday. It's amazing to see God's hand at work and how much we've changed and learned and grown. And, and I felt led to this message it, it's good to be reminded from time to time to be ready to meet him. Kids in a game of hide and seek have no clue how fast the person counting will get to 50. Some kids can count very fast. Some kids count slow. They, they can catch others off guard. You know, it's, it's kind of, as a kid, it was kind of risky. Sometimes you had to hide behind a tree or down in a little ditch because you didn't get far enough. We as Christians have no clue when the Lord's coming back. We really don't. And that's not a kid's game either. The reality is, are you aware that he's coming back? 
whether you're ready or not. Ready or not, here he comes. Now that puts a different spin on that phrase, doesn't it? Makes it more serious. Scripture specifically states that we won't be expecting it. Matthew 24, 44, Therefore, also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So we do not have a clue when he's returning. We might have an idea that it's coming. Maybe we might be living near the end times, but we don't know when it's going to happen. Just as a seeker yells, ready or not, here I come when you're playing hide and seek. So the Lord is saying, be ready. You don't know when I'm coming. I'd like to just take a different approach here. I want to talk about our past a little bit. I want to talk about where we're at the present and then talk about our future. And just talk about being watchmen for ourselves, for other people, to be ready to meet Jesus. That should be our primary goal, getting us to heaven and getting others to heaven. Let's talk about our past for a little bit. You look throughout scripture, and I know people say things are much worse now than they were. I, I don't know, things were pretty bad back then too. Um, you see the corruption, the, the sin, this, the, the chaos, the confusion. And then we start seeing these promises of a coming Messiah, then born in lowly circumstances. In Matthew 9, 35, then it says, Jesus went about in all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So Jesus was the watchman of that time. If you remember last Sunday, Jesus was God's ambassador. Jesus was the watchman. He told people how to live. He gave them instructions on how to be right with God and, and then provided them an example on how to live. Then, not only that, he also trained watchmen, his disciples, to take his job on after he went back to heaven. And then those disciples are supposed to train others. They were good examples of being good watchmen, these disciples, and they trained others. 2,000 years-ish since then, we're still doing that. There's still much teaching and preaching about the return of Christ. We've had some people state emphatically, they knew the, the date and some even maybe the hour of Christ's return. They were wrong. I hope I'm not coming across as sacrilegious here, but I, I find I find a bit of my maybe orneriness coming out when I think of God in heaven, <coughs> maybe with a sense of humor. Oh, you think you're I'm returning on that date? I'll just move it down the calendar a little bit. No one knows. We've seen signs of the times for years, we've said. We've had people say, we're living in the end times. How many of you, even those of you that are getting a little bit more mature in years, remember your parents telling you, Jesus is coming back soon, we're living in the end times. But he hasn't yet. There are Christians in countries that have been persecuted for years and have probably said a long time ago they've been living in the end times. We've seen signs that Christ's return is nearer now than it was before. But that still doesn't tell us when. And for all we know, it could be another 2,000 years. You really don't know. And because of this, some people have fallen into apathy. Ah, oh, he won't return for a long time. I've got plenty of time in such statements as that. Let's talk about our present right now, where we're living right now. <clears throat> Something that causes me great concern is the apathy, is the lack of concern I see in our churches for spiritual matters. People that call themselves Christians demonstrate a great apathy today in general. So many people are happy just to live their life and, and life of comfort. They don't ask God to stretch them or don't ask God those tough questions that require them to do anything new. It might require some effort on their part. We're just uh, happy where we're at. Complacency 
is a blight that saps energy, dulls attitudes, and causes a drain on the brain. The first symptom of complacency is satisfaction with things as they are. Things are going fine. Why rock the boat? We're happy with where we're at. We're, we're, we don't want to change anything. And I see a complacent attitude all around us today. As long as things are going well and I'm, I'm comfortable to come and sit in my seat and put in my time and go home, that's fine with me. The problem with being comfortable with where you're at means you're not moving forward. An old farmer frequently described his Christian experience by saying, well, I'm not making much progress, but I'm well established. One spring when he was hauling some logs, his wagon wheels sank down to the axles in mud. Try as he would, he couldn't get the wagon out. Defeated, he sat atop the logs, viewing the dismal situation. Soon a neighbor, who had always been uncomfortable with the farmer's worn out testimony, came along and greeted him. Well, Brother Jones, I see you're not making much progress, but you're certainly well established. The second symptom of complacency is rejection of things that might be. Afraid of change. Good enough becomes today's watchword and tomorrow's standard. Well, I'm doing good enough. I'm certainly not as bad as those people. How many times have you heard those excuses? And if we continue to follow that mentality, we will slide backward. Complacency makes people fear the unknown, mistrust the untried, and abhor the new. Like water, complacent people follow the easiest course downhill. They draw false strength from looking back. Complacent Christians, whether they want to admit it or not, or even are willing to see it, they're only going one way, and that's down. While they might try to convince themselves I'm standing firm or I'm staying where I'm at, no. If you're not moving forward, you'll be sliding backwards. Proverbs 24, 30, and 31, one of the most powerful verses, passages in Scripture about complacency. I went by the field of the lazy man and by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding, and there it was, all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone walls had broken down. One thing that was really kind of shocking was when we first moved here, and not that the parsonage was falling apart, but how quickly a, a building can deteriorate if no one's maintaining it daily. Um, snakes had gotten in, and we found three different snake skins, different places over the first year we were in there. Um, mold was growing quite rapidly in the basement, a lot of black mold in the basement. And I spent quite a bit of time just, just getting it ready. And I realized that I hadn't taken that action then, how bad it would have gotten in a short time. But the thing to realize, and I know this is an inanimate object and, and really nothing in the grand scheme of things, but the parsley was just sitting there. It wasn't doing anything. It wasn't purposely trying to fall apart. It just started deteriorating because it wasn't being maintained. And that's a great picture of us as Christians. And I recognize the, the analogy may be kind of lame, but it does give us a great picture. We as Christians need spiritual daily maintenance or we will fail. We will deteriorate. We won't stay the same. We won't keep a straight level. No, it's not going to happen. We will slide back. That's not being a good watchman, God, good and alert watchman. And I'll speak on that here in a minute. Now let's talk about our future a little bit. I started this message talking about watchmen and, and how important it is to watch over our own souls and help others. That you need to be a watchman and warn people of the return of Christ. If we do our part and warn people of the return of Christ, then we are clear of any obligation on our part. We did our part. 
But if we don't, Scripture says that their blood will be on us. You know, I think of myself as pastor, and I think, "Wow, that's uh, I have to I have to be a good watchman. That's a that's a job. That's that's a solemn responsibility." And it tells me that if I want to do a good job with that, I better make sure that I am where I need to be with Jesus, and I need to be a good watchman over my own soul. There are parents here this morning. What an awesome responsibility God has given us to be watchmen over our children. Are we doing our part? And I recognize that there are always exceptions to the rule, but I have seen kids that strayed from the faith. And parents wonder, why did that happen? And this is in a case where I've seen it, and I'm not casting any stones, but in, in some specific situations I've watched it, it was because the parents weren't serious. They were complacent. And the kids just didn't see the need, the necessity for it. I've seen um, statistics, and I'm not sure how incredibly accurate it is, but I have watched it where, let's say, the grandparents went to church faithfully every time the doors were open, and the parents were like, well, we'll hit it maybe once a week or once every other week, and that'll be good enough to get to the kids, and they don't go at all because they don't see the need. We have a priceless treasure in our children, our grandchildren. Let's not lose them. Let's be watchmen over them. And we need to be watchmen over our own souls. We need to be alert, stay close to Jesus ourselves. You know, referring back to the subject of daily maintenance, it's amazing to me how many Christians, they call themselves Christians, yet they don't read the Bible and they don't spend time in prayer. You can't maintain a Christian life if you don't communicate with the one that gives it to you. You don't want nettles and thorns and mold to grow in your hearts. Black Friday is a is a day. Now I don't know so much today because it's more online, but you know, 15, 20 years ago, I'm sure all of you remember the chaos of the Black Friday. And they definitely lived up to his name. It was black. It was it was ugly. Um, every year people would act like idiots and, and stand in line for hours and fight over the last laptop or thing piece of ham or whatever and my dad even said that one there was I think it was in his store one time there was two women fighting over a piece of ham that, that they or Walmart or something that they were wanting to get trying to get those deals I think you've even heard stories of people being trampled on some of those stampedes into the stores I remember one Black Friday in particular this is when computers were suddenly taking a boom in technology and they were starting to get really impressive and um, now it's really no big deal, but they were running some really good sales at Staples on some computer products that I really wanted. And my brother and I, it was like 150 bucks in savings. And I look back on that and it wasn't worth it. I was it stayed in bed now, but um, we got up at like 3.30 or four o'clock and got over to Staples and got mine at four. I know for some of you, this is not early, but it, to me, it was pretty, pretty intensely serious. Stood in line at five and waited till six till the store opened and there were about a hundred feet of people in line and we got in and got our stuff and it was it wasn't too terrible, but it was busy. I never did it again. I realized my brother was going anyway. I can get him to pick up my stuff. I don't need to go. <laughs> but my point is for stuff like that, people prepared for it. They went to extra measures, maybe they studied the papers. Like I remember Thanksgiving Day, my aunts and uncles, they were sitting at the table with all the flyers and they were reading through everything and, and they studied it. Studied God's word that much maybe, huh? Gave me go to bed early, get up early, you know, a lot of preparation just to get a good deal. Do we put that kind of effort into preparing for heaven? Do we study God's word? Do we take time? I mean, that's just a little bit more important than getting a good deal on Black Friday. Getting to heaven should be our first and primary goal. So the question is, do we want it? And what are we willing to do to get it? I wonder, just as a side note, this isn't in my notes, but I wonder how many people would be willing to go stand in line to get salvation, to get into heaven, if it meant getting up at three o'clock and standing in line and cool. Would they be willing to make that sacrifice? 
what will we do to make sure we get to heaven and take as many people with us as we can? The thing to keep in mind is that Satan knows his time is running short. Revelation 12, 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. That was printed many, many years ago, around 2,000 years to be exact, but it rings true and truer today. Satan knows his time is running short. I have felt his attack stronger over the years. It keeps, it keeps building. But Satan knows he needs to fight harder to keep people from making it to heaven. And we need to fight harder to make sure he doesn't win. And the question is, are we determined that he's already lost? Because scripture says he has. Are we doing everything to make sure that Satan has not won? There are souls that need to get into heaven. Are we doing our part to be good watchmen for them? Are we doing our part to be good watchmen for ourselves? I debated how to wrap things up here. I've got time. I'm going to go ahead and read it. I know it's. I know you've probably heard it before. It's a couple pages here, but everyone knows this story, and. It's really eerily similar to what just happened here a few weeks ago. On May 28th, 19, or 1889, a storm formed over Nebraska and Kansas and headed east. When the storm struck the Johnstown South Fork area two days later, it was the worst downpour that had ever been recorded in that part of the country. The U.S. Army Signal Corps estimated that six to ten inches of rain fell in 24 hours over the region, which is nothing compared to what North Carolina just got. During the night, small creeks became roaring torrents, ripping up trees and debris. Telegraph lines were down and rail lines were washed away. Before daybreak, the Connemaw River that ran through Johnstown was about to overwhelm its banks. On the morning of May 31st in a farmhouse on a hill just above the South Fork Dam, Elias Unger, president of the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club, awoke to the sight of Lake Connemaw, swollen after a night-long heavy rainfall. Unger ran outside in the still pouring rain to assess the situation and saw that the water was nearly cresting the dam. He quickly assembled a group of men to, fa to save the face of the dam by trying to unclog the spillway. <laughs> it was blocked by the broken fish trap and debris caused by the swollen water line. Other men tried digging another spillway at the other end of the dam to relieve the pressure without success. Most remained on top of the dam, some plowing earth to raise it, while others tried to pile mud and rock on the face to save the eroding wall. John Park, an engineer for the South Fork Club, briefly considered cutting through the dam's end where the pressure would be less, but they sided against it. And listen to this. Twice, under orders from Unger, Park rode on horseback to the nearby town of South Fork to telegraph to the telegraph office to send warnings to Johnstown, explaining the critical nature of the eroding dam. But the warnings were not passed to the authorities in town, as there have been many false alarms in the past of the South Fork Dam not holding against flooding. Unger, Park, and the rest of the men continued working until exhausted to save the face of the dam. They abandoned their efforts around 1.30 p.m., fearing that their efforts were futile and the dam was at risk of imminent collapse. Unger ordered all of his men to fall back to high ground on both sides of the dam where they would continue to do nothing but wait. Around 3.10 p.m., the South Fourth Dam collapsed, freeing the 20 million tons of Lake Conemaw to cascade down the Little Conemaw River. It took about 40 minutes for the entire lake to drain of the water. The first town to be hit by the, south, by the flood was South Fork. The, the town was on high ground and most of the people escaped by running up the nearby hills when they saw the dam spill over. Some 20 to 30 houses were destroyed or washed away and four people were killed. On its way downstream toward Johnstown, 14 miles away, the crest picked up debris such as trees, houses, and animals. As the Conemaw Viaduct, at the Conemaw Viaduct, a 78-foot high railroad bridge, the flood temporarily was stopped when debris jammed against the stone bridge's arch. But within seven minutes, the viaduct collapsed, allowing the flood to resume its course. Because of this, the surging river gained renewed hydraulic head, resulting in a stronger wave hitting Johnstown than otherwise would have been expected. The small town of Mineral Point, one mile below the Conemaw Viaduct, was hit with this renewed force. About 30 families lived on the village's single street. After the flood, only bare rock remained. 
about 16 people were killed. The East Village of East Connemaw was next. One witness was on high ground near the, high, near the town, described the water as almost obscured by debris, resembling a huge hill rolling over and over. From his locomotive, the engineer John Hess heard the rumbling of the approaching flood. Throwing his locomotive in reverse, Hess raced backward towards East Connemaw, the whistle blowing constantly. His warning saved many people who reached high ground. When the flood hit, it picked up the locomotive and tossed it aside. Hess himself survived, but at least 50 people died, including about 25 passengers stranded on trains in the town. Before hitting the main part of Johnstown, the flood surge hit the Cambria Ironworks in the town of Woodvale, sweeping up railroad cars and barbed wire in its moil. Of Woodvale's 1,100 residents, 314 died in the flood. Boilers exploded when the flood hit the uh, wireworks, causing black smoke to be seen by Johnstown residents. Miles of its barbed wire became entangled in the debris in the floodwaters. Some 57 minutes after the South Fork Dam collapsed, the flood hit Johnstown. The residents were caught by surprise as the wall of water and debris bore down, traveling at 40 miles an hour and reaching a height of 60 feet in some places. Some realized the danger tried to escape by running towards high ground, but most people were hit by the surging floodwater. Many people were crushed by pieces of debris, and others became caught in barbed wire from the wire factory upstream. Those who reached attics or managed to stay afloat on pieces of floating debris waited for hours for help to arrive. At Johnstown, the stone bridge, which was a substantial arch structure, carried the Pennsylvania Railroad across the Connemaw River. The debris carried by the flood formed a temporary dam on the bridge, resulting in the flood surge rolling upstream along the Stony Creek River. Eventually, gravity caused the surge to return to the dam, causing a second wave to hit the city, but from a different direction. Some people who had been washed downstream became trapped in an inferno as the debris piled up against the stone bridge caught fire. At least 80 people died there. The fire at Stone Bridge burned for three days. After floodwaters receded, the pile of debris at the bridge was seen to cover 30 acres and reach 70 feet in height. It took workers three months to remove the massive debris, largely because it was bound by steel wire from the ironworks. Dynamite was eventually used to clear it. Still standing and in use as the railroad bridge, the stone bridge is a landmark associated with survival and recovery for the flood. In 2008, it was restored to pro in a project including new lighting as part of a commemorative activities related to the flood. The total death toll was 2,209 people making the disaster the largest loss of civilian life in the United States at that time. It was later surpassed by the fatalities in the 1900 Galveston hurricane and then in September 11, 2001, terrorist attacks. 99 entire families died in the flood, including 396 children, 124 women, and 198 men were widowed, 98 children were orphaned. One third of the dead, 777 people were never identified. Their remains were buried in the plot of the unknown in Grandview Cemetery in Westmont. It was the worst flood to hit the U.S. in the 19th century. 1,600 homes were destroyed, 17 million in property damage, and four square miles of Johnstown was completely destroyed. Cleanup operations continued for years. And I apologize for the length of that, but do you think, you know the thing that stood out to me most in that account? Not the crazy damage or the tragedies and the lives lost, but they were warned and they ignored it. They could have been saved. Now the flood wouldn't have stopped and the town still would have been washed up, washed out. I'm thinking too of the tragedy that happened in North Carolina and and some people were saying, well, why weren't you prepared for it? Why weren't you ready? They couldn't prepare for it. There was no way of knowing. It came with no warning. Now I'm standing here today to tell you that a far greater event is going to take place than any flood. And as tragic as that was, Jesus is coming back and he promised it. And he's going to come without warning. Many people said the same thing and people scoff. They, they've been saying that for 2,000 years and it hasn't happened yet. Well, the people in Johnstown, how many years ago said, well, that never happened. And they were caught off guard. 
And I want to tell you, Jesus is coming back and there are going to be people caught off guard. And so I'm giving you a warning, trusting you are ready, and I trust you'll spread that warning to be good watchmen. Because unlike in Johnstown or tragedy here just a few weeks ago, more souls than a couple thousand will be lost. I had originally prepared this sermon about 10 years ago. And do you know what I found when I Googled population of the world? In 10 years, there's a billion more people in the world. It was 7 billion when I prepared the first time. Now there's 8, just under 8. And I checked how many Christians there are in the world. It's believed to be about 31%. I'm going to tell you I am skeptical of that number. That's probably people that say they're Christians and aren't, is, is my guess. Or some of them aren't. But 31 professing Christians, we'll leave it at that. But even so, that number, assuming that 31% of the world's population is Christian, there are 5.5 billion people that have yet to hear about Jesus or accept him. Now think if Jesus came back and all of them didn't make it. I think it uh, is a pretty solemn statistic. Jesus is going to return with a shout, the sound of a trumpet, and those that are serving him will make it to heaven. But those that are not are going to be lost for eternity. What are we doing to be good watchmen? I don't want to miss it. That is one warning that I'm going to heed. And in my mind's eye, I can see Jesus standing at the gates of heaven saying, ready or not, here I come. Would you stand with me, please? I know that um, the structure of our services have changed over the years, structures of churches have changed over the years, but I just want to take a moment and someone needs to pray. If you feel like you need, you're not ready to meet him, you can do that today. If you're watching online, you can stop. You can heed the warning. And there'll be no fear of his return. I'll close in prayer. And if you feel like you need to pray, come up and we'll pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have provided so many details and instructions in your work for preparing for eternity. And while we have no idea when that will happen, we do know that we need to be ready for it. And I pray that you help us to be alert for our own souls, to be ready, and to share the warning of others to others and be good watchmen for them. Help us to put you as our first and primary goal in our lives. We thank you, Lord. We love you and pray that you will keep us close to you. In your name, amen.